Are these people queuing or coming in to see Francisco? Are, are these see people coming to see? No. <laughs> All right. Man, you're, you're more popular than Taylor Swift. <laughs> I wish I were as pretty. It's a love story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. I'm not going to sing, by the way. I oh, hope oh, you guys oh. didn't get this. It's a oh. nice AI story. All right. Thank you all for coming. We're nearly there. Uh, people have almost all joined. And thank you so much for joining this session on Go to Market. I have a little bit of bad news. So I'm going to put it out straight away. If you're here hoping for go to market for you know building the chatbots we've seen before maybe you're helping an HR company this is probably not the right session for you go online Google Peter Thiel get a zero to one book read that it's a lot better um, what I decided to take advantage of for this session is for people that are looking and maybe you know the governments are a good uh, addition here people that are trying to build deep tech solutions uh, AI AI enhanced or even hardware based um, so deep tech, technically, for challenging industries. I mean, if you are here hoping to achieve impact, bit changing the future of climate, energy, defense, uh, this type of stuff, then you're in the right place. So if you want to leave, I'm not going to get offended. Please stand up and go. If you are staying, then you know what you're getting in, uh, into. All right. That's it. That's the strategy for attaining product market fit across industries. And like I said, I'm going to focus on challenging industries. So. That's me. Hopefully, I look as pretty in real life. Uh, and like I mentioned before, I'm a computer scientist. I spend my day job in software uh, building architectures all my life. But then my night job was, well, what I decided to do was to build a community, maybe because I was an Italian lonely person in London when I arrived a decade and a half ago. And through that community, I realized actually a lot of founders, engineers, scientists were coming to showcase early products, especially in deep tech. And so eventually, I started investing in them as an angel. And that led me down a rabbit hole, which eventually led me to launch Silly Grand Ventures as a deep tech-focused pre-seed and seed venture fund at the end of 2022. Uh, and now we're operational. We are backing companies. We've got eight portfolio companies in the fund. Uh, as you can see, you know, climate computing, defense, health, anything. And of course, beyond, the, the core to it is Deep tech, infrastructure technologies, uh, the next infrastructure of chips, semiconductors, or anything else you might want. So, what is a challenge in industries? Now, we have some names, but effectively, the challenge in industry is an industry which is heavily monopolized, or that is heavily regulated, uh, or it's got a lot of incumbents, or where you might need to make some very powerful friends to get in the traditional way. Now, of course, because I'm all about startups, I think there are different ways to penetrate that. But they are challenging, hence the title, Challenging Industry. So if you're not any of these two, or a brother or a cousin of any of these two, or the lookalikes around the world, what can you do you know, to penetrate industries that have historically been dominated by uh, families or corporations like uh, the ones connected to those folks? And in short, um, a challenging industry is mostly made up of different reasons why it might be challenging. And you know, it might these may all apply, or just some of these may apply. But effectively, it's got to do with regulations. So they might be heavily regulated. It might have to do with the players in the industry. There might be an, oligar an oligarchy of a few players that monopolize it. It might be that historically, they have been controlled by governments. And most of the eight actors within it are effectively having a direct channel with the governments. And then they create uh, a substrate from through which all of the startups have to go through, uh, and or any of these above. Or of course, long sales cycles, which you know, if you're a young startup or a builder uh, and you've got runway for 12 months, it might not actually sort of well fit into your plan. So what's on the menu today? You know, right now we've just defined what a challenge in industry. So on the menu today, again, I'm not gonna sing, is actually talking about how as a deep tech company, especially a very young deep tech company, or someone that is going to launch a company soon, how can you somehow hack this system? How can you try and find that product market fit if you're building a solution, AI or other deep tech, uh, for industries that are not as straightforward to get into, like building you know, a platform that an HR recruiter that we've not seen before might just adopt? And so, 
what can you do? Well, the first thing is actually market research. Now, obviously, everybody will say that, so you know that's quite obvious. But in practice, if you're in one of those industries, what you really need to start to figure out are the customer needs and constraints within the supply chain. Uh, and that's very important because there's no use for you to just have an amazing technology and thinking that just because you have an amazing technology, you're just going to be able to commercialize it. If you don't realize the constraints within the supply chain, and then realize data within, you know, sort of what could be data points within the whole uh, structure of the supply chains, uh, and spot anomalies, and eventually gain ambassadors to win those anomalies. We'll talk about more in details what that means later. Uh, then you need to sort of get all of this data and knowledge and start to look at customer segmentation, i.e., the cost, how do you basically enter into an industry which is challenging to get into? Um, might not be a linear process. It's probably not going to be a linear process. And you might need to try and find doors to get into to validate your product, to build trust, and we'll see examples later of companies that have done that, and then use that trust to go on to the next step, and then use that trust to go on to the next step. So using your research, you really need to, you really need to focus a lot harder than any typical, let's say, software, vanilla B2B stuff startup, in then, in then using that knowledge and you know, the people that can advise you and maybe be a bit of a Trojan horse for you to then segment the market and trying to spot anomalies. And what I mean by anomalies are like things that don't quite work. And for some reason, there are some people within companies or within governments or organizations that are actively looking to work with startups, especially startups like you. And then you can try and find ways in or, or unfair information through those sorts of small doors. And then finally then, Try and figure out what is your competitive advantage. Now, and what I mean is not just that you're doing something better, but what is your step change? Like, what is that as a company, you're not just doing better, you are literally doing something which is absurdly better. And, you know, we can look at, for example, Norval, right? You know, everybody knows Norval. Anybody doesn't know Norval? That's probably quicker. All right, everybody knows it. All right, so they started leveraging as kind of their uh, starting point, the background of the founders, and they used the fact that they were Tesla-like, city people, um, you know, people living in Tesla and having knowledge, in, insider's knowledge, to uh, then build trust to get early investors, and the early investors combined with their background allow them to start to go to the next phase, which was getting government approval, uh, effectively getting um, governments to a little bit of a stamp of approval, and they used grants, they used loans, uh, and they used uh, various sort of early wins at government level uh, to sort of tell the world, and especially future clients, that they were not a fad, they were, the, they were there to stay, and they were a reality, and they were to be taken seriously. They then used that to strike partnerships, partnerships with corporates that if you look back in history, they got sort of more and more difficult to get into, um, as they got more and more mature. So there was a little bit of a strategy in, in trying to get into maybe partnerships with corporates that were very eager to work with upcoming startups in their field, which is energy, uh, eventually to get into the automotives that now they're famous for and they have major contracts with. But that they didn't just show up on day one uh, to go and get into Volkswagen or BMW that they have a contract with today uh, and say, hey, you know, sign a 10 million contract with me. And then, but then again, that allowed them to then raise huge rounds, which now they're famous for, and eventually used all of this to start to lock in major contracts. So it was a, a progressive cycle. And if you start to notice what I'm saying here, there is one thing which is constant, which is how do you build trust and how do you leverage your exceptionality? And at every stage, you iterate and build more trusts to get into bigger things. So, specifically, how are startups winning monetization today? How are you finding that product market fit that is the subject of today's presentation uh, in different industries? So if, you, if the industry is difficult because you, it has high capital requirement and long uh, return of investment cycles, uh, then you basically have a challenge, right? Because investors, like might be one, I might be one, uh, or even customers might not trust that you're gonna stick around for a long time. So that's a challenge. Right? Because you know, if you're going to disappear, then my money goes away, my investor's money goes away, and that's really bad. Uh, or there might be regulatory challenges. 
if the industry is heavily regulated, uh, you might not just show up and sell to a customer because the customer might require you to have certain things in place. Um, and so, you know, you've got all these nightmares, especially in the, in, in the industry, in the energy market here specifically, uh, where, you know, it is a high capex type of company, say, Norvolt has to build a plant. It is heavily regulated. You know, what's your backup plan if the energy regulation changes and suddenly what you thought was an edge for you has kind of gone? Uh, and we've seen that a lot with, for example, in the U.S. subsidies and a lot of companies that are saying, hey, you know, I'm leveraging the subsidies. Everything is butterflies and unicorn. What if they turn down the tap? Is your entire business allowing you to be profitable just because of that? That could be a challenge. How do you address that? Uh, or it could be also technological complexities. I mean, again, uh, we've seen Norvold building a gigafactory. It's obviously a huge task, but you know, right now I'm looking at startups that are building fusion reactors, which we don't even know as of yet how to make them viable. So again, the technology per se might not even be uh, something that we know for sure is going to work. So there is a um, there, there is like a, a, a difficulty in even developing and integrating the technology into the existing infrastructure because even assuming that you can make it work in the lab, how do you then take your results in the lab and convince a customers or a government to trust you to build something that is going to integrate into the global supply chain of energy? Again, batteries for Novold, uh, energy production if you're building that type of things. Uh, and then, of course, environment and sustainability. I mean, have you figured out what, are the, what is the public concern? I mean, Italy, I'm from Italy, if you probably guess from the accent and the name, uh, and Germany, as far as I'm concerned, they completely screw up by canceling out nuclear as a no-no. Now, um, if you were a company building nuclear stuff in Italy, right now, you would be also screwed because even doing R&D would be extremely challenging, right? And actually, I know a specific company that uh, set up in the UK precisely because uh, that they couldn't develop down there, even though the founder is Italian. And so that emotional backlash, whatever you're going to do, um, can be an extra minefield. So if you're going to penetrate something like the energy market, for example, you know, this specific example here, you've got to keep this in mind. Um, but what can be good strategies, for example, if you're in the energy field? Well, the first thing is that um, you can collaborate with incumbents. You need to be careful not to kill your future prospects of collaborating with others. So be careful with lock-ins, be careful with getting investments early on from these incumbents. This is basically the biggest part where you need to work with them, you need them to validate what you're doing, but you need to be careful that you, they don't own your, your basically go to market. Because otherwise, yes, you're kind of finding product market fit, but you're also giving it away to someone that is a lot bigger, has got a lot more money, and can effectively decide at any point whether they want to buy you for cheap or just kill you off. Uh, and it's not a nice position to be, right? So you want to work with them, but you need to be careful when they come on your cap table. If they want to come on your cap table, make sure they're a, minor a minority stakeholder that don't have any particular veto rights or stuff like that. And if they don't come on the cap table, that they don't control your go-to-market effectively. Uh, and that can be quite difficult especially if you're a young company. So every type, is you know, every type of energy company is different, but these are some examples. But this applies also to other industri uh, industries where that is a constraint. You know, the fact that there is a small minority of companies, huge companies that control the field. Uh, then government lobbying. So on one side, the government, obviously, in something like an energy, is heavily involved, and that is a challenge as part of making the industry challenge to penetrate. On the flip side, they might have things that you can use. So for example, in the UK, you know, that's a screenshot for something that's live now, actually, the Liberty Project. If you're in Fusion, you can use it. You can actually maybe speak to your university or figure out how to get part of that grant funding. But a grant funding is only, well, obviously, this money is always welcome. But it's not just about the money. It's about, the, it's, about, it's about getting into talking to the right people and get that stamp of approval. Uh, or you can have, in, in the US, for example, ARPA E. It's like a it's kind of DARPA for energy. So Again, they're looking for innovative solutions. So you can try and find departments and areas where either in the corporates or in the governments, you've got right, the right people that are happy to talk to you, even if you're a tiny company. Uh, that's very important. And then, of course, you know, this is specific to energy, you know, focus on sustainability. So how can you turn the regulation into an advantage, especially upcoming regulation? Can you use the need, even for big corporates and governments, 
to stick to their pledges to your advantage. You know, I have a portfolio company in recycling um, that is actually using that, the fact that the, right now there are certain targets that have to be met that even big gigafactories or governments can't meet as of today, but they have to stick to them. So that's a great way in for a tiny startup that can actually show up and say, well, I can do this like today, not tomorrow. Uh, and then, you know, another case study this is another company in my portfolio that I think did something really right at the very beginning. So, for example, the founders were not, you know, we've seen with Tesla, you know, the ex-Tesla people found in um, Norvold, they were not ex-Tesla people uh, or having similar backgrounds. So what they did very early on was to get an ex-McLaren person to join as a chair. So make use of your board or of the very strategic sort of partnerships with angels or early adopters, well, early supporters as a way to add validation if you don't have founder sort of you know, backgrounds to, um, to, to create a level of trust. Find government supports, again, grants and government-backed accelerators. The money is great, maybe the startup support not as much, but you need to be smarter using that as a stamp of approval and also getting connections into the right people in government that then you can really get support from. Uh, and make sure that your tech is kind of plug and play with the ecosystem. If the supply chain is a major issue, if people, corporates, have invested billions to build their factories and things like that, you cannot just expect that they're going to give you a trial. I mean, they might give you a trial and it's not going to go anywhere. So you need to make sure that your technology works well with what exists today, that it doesn't require them to spend a bunch of billions to change the system for something that nobody even knows if it's going to work, right? So try to always think supply chain first. Um, other industry, as an example, manufacturing, you know, three challenges, three potential solutions you can apply, you know, for instance, in the, in the national manufacturing, you've got complex supply chains, once again, like in energy, how can you think about, how could, what could be a strategy to find product market fit there? Now, you can have modular architecture, so if it's easy for you to customize it, you can adapt it to customers without losing scalability. That's very important because initially you might have to, you know, do things that don't quite scale. Um, and if you're literally just becoming a consultant, you're not a startup anymore. Uh, or you might have to deal with leg legacy infrastructure. In that case, how do you sort of fight that risk aversion? Well, you can start with pilots, and then you can use the pilots to validate. And it's not just within a particular company. I've seen it in my portfolio company, where actually maybe a pilot didn't go anywhere. But at the, in that time period where they had the brand of the company that was giving them trust, they went to win something else. So make sure that you use pilots also as a way to say, hey, I'm not a, something that's going to disappear. I'm not a scam. My tech works. It's currently being used. And you keep winning on the back of that. Uh, or you, know, you use a, this regula regulatory compliance issues that you know, can be a constraint to your advantage. So you can actually help incumbents win, like we've mentioned before, like it happens in energy. Same in you know, industrial manufacturing. Everybody's trying to optimize. right? Their margins are really low. They just have a huge scale. Can you actually help them make money and avoid losing money when they have to implement new regulations? Again, ESG is another big issue here, right? So if you can spot where your tech can give them a substantial advantage over their competition, then you can talk, right? Um, another example, defense. Who's here trying to or have thought of entering defense? Anyone? Yes, great. Now, defense is great. I think, you know, we all can do something in the world uh, by actually supporting it and rather than not talking about it at all. Uh, but how do you send there's something as crazy as defense where there are big primes and governments monopolizing it? Uh, well, you can start to understand landscape first and then turn challenges into moats. Or you can even start to build partnerships with the right government bodies um, or the sections of government back bodies, like for example, NATO now has an accelerator. So if you look for NATO, you can actually join Diana and you can even get funded by the uh, NATO investment fund. And even if you don't get the funding, the people are quite approachable because they're mostly venture capitalists uh, and ex-founders. So irrespective of the outcome, they tend to be quite approachable people. They're not government people sitting behind the desk. And then you can use that as a bridge in. And a great case study is another portfolio company of mine that actually uh, Green Jets, they work on aerospace propulsion, and what they realized is that uh, thanks to their own, you know, old bosses' connections and their early investors' connections, like I was pleased to be one of them, uh, they actually were vi quite demanding and very specific about the people that they wanted to reach. And so if you know, and think before, you know, you've mapped the ecosystem, you know who you want to reach, you know the outcome, you can then be 
almost like annoying to your backers to actually get as much information back out. And so if you make it very specific to your early angels, your early supporters, your early partners, who you want to reach, then these people will connect back to you. And guess what? Thanks to those connections, they eventually managed to get their product live in Ukraine. It's deployed now. And actually, that is quite useful because uh, they're getting an actual test of their technology as we speak in very harsh conditions, as well as the stamp of approval. Again, the trust that we, meant, that we said before. So now this is enabling to be taken more seriously by bigger primes and bigger organizations. So always try to find what is the sort of shortest path from where you sit today into gaining more trust and then leveraging that more trust to then take another step into something that gives you more trust and that eventually gets you to speak to the same level of corporates even if you've got a much smaller budget. Another example, medicine, super regulated industry. You wanna enter the medicine world, what do you do? Uh, well, if you're in biotech, you can't avoid clinical trials. You basically go shoot for it, succeed or fail. I mean, in a way, that's what you do. If you're not in biotech, at least you're not developing a drug as a company. Actually, the question is, how do you decouple from clinical trials? What can you do to make sure that your outcome is not pegged to the success of a clinical trial? Are you becoming a horizontal platform that, for example, you know, does cancer diagnostics? Again, I've got an example in my portfolio that has managed to do that, is trying to do that more and more. Um, so how do you take your success away from the need for a clinical trial to be successful. Now, if you can do that, then it's, a, it's much easier because then the question of clinical trials being successful doesn't impact, or at least doesn't fully impact, your capacity to raise funds or your capacity to close clients. Uh, how do you create a patient-centric design, and especially a patient-centric design that takes into consideration the practitioners that are gonna use your technologies, and they probably not all of them will be sort of super tech friendly and able to do whatever you expect them to do. So make sure that you're able to actually help them, you know, your customers or the intermediaries save money and in a very evident, clear, simple way that doesn't require them to become tech experts overnight in something that be quite, you know, complex. Um, how do you overcome resistance to change. It might just be that you have to figure out who your early adopters within your early adopters are and you manage to get them to use your tech or you might get early validations um, because of your product. I'm now looking at a company that is trying to penetrate a certain type of bio market, uh, biopharma market and um, you know, even finding people within there to speak to before they speak go and talk contracts, it's quite useful to them because they've realized, they're realizing more and more how the supply chain works and, how, and what are the barriers to entry even within the organization. Um, and how do you fix shortages profit, for profitably? That's actually how you potentially can overcome issues in any of the other three aspects. So in medicine, you know, one very heavily regulated industry, uh, big monopolies and all of that, it still suffers from big shortages might be shortages of isotopes in the radio pharma industry. It might be shortages of doctors you know, in the NHS. We're all aware of that. If you can figure out how your tech and your company can actually take advantage of shortages, uh, issues, like big issues that are costing them billions, and you can kind of fix it quite quickly, it's going to be a lot easier for you to get into at least a pilot. Then from a pilot, you can scale inside the company. Uh, and so having that sort of North Star metrics quite clear for you to go and talk to people uh, in the space, it can help you penetrate that particular industry and it can be applied to industries that have similar uh, barriers to entries. Uh, and so, effectively, what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that ultimately you want to identify a compelling value proposition for your company and your technology and that is quite specific to the industry and the customers you're going into. You want to segment that market, maybe the beachhead market, the customers that will give you the early pilots and early contracts are not your ultimate goal. Maybe they're not that sort of multi-billion dollar market that, startup, that investors like me want to see, or your ultimate backers and customers want to see, but at least it gives you revenue or gives you some validation. And then you find ways where you can win, your early wins can unlock bigger wins later on. So always have this very clear map and then find proprietary way to get feedback to work, that, to work it out, you know, ways in which you can get information back, 
And a case study is another portfolio company of mine, New Quantum, that actually they've developed this amazing uh, quantum networking technology. But they, did a sh they had to do a very strong pivot at some point, and they did it by speaking to customers in ways. So they organized this UK Day Trade Association. They were one of the founders. And that allowed them, as a tiny Cambridge sort of seed company, to have conversations with the heads of BT, the heads of all the telcos and companies that were interested in quantum. And that allowed them to see that actually what they were pursuing as a business strategy could be improved by changing direction and targeting something else that was a lot more important to their customers. Uh, and so unlocking these multi-million contracts was, all, was not just about, hey, we've got a great tech, but also, hey, we figured out that what we initially thought we're going to use this tech for is not what our customers need. We're going to change the way we're going to go to market with this tech. Uh, and so that's kind of it. That's kind of the end, you know, adapt to a post-2021 landscape. I don't build tech for tech's sake. Uh, it doesn't matter how amazing it is if it's not live. Try and find as hard as you can to get your tech in the hands of customers in any way you can. Or, and then, of course, try to generate revenue. Unless you're <laughs> Mr. AI, you're probably not going to get a bunch of hundreds of million in funding three weeks into your startup life. So if you're not that, then how can you get some revenue? And it might be that you're saying, hey, I want to fix the energy market, but I'm actually going to start selling into the radio farm markets, and I'm going to make revenue over the next year. Or I want to fix aviation, and I'm going to sell into the drones market because right now it's booming and defense needs that, but actually I want to decarbonize aviation in the long term. Having those sorts of stepping stones figured out can help you generate revenue, even as a deep tech company. Uh, and you know, my, some of my portfolio companies are doing it, so it is possible. You don't have to raise hundreds of millions necessarily to hit revenue. Uh, and of course, turn regulations into modes. The same things that prevents you from entering an industry is preventing lo loads of other people from entering the industry. So if you can just find a way to turn at least one into an advantage for you, actually that's not only a way in, it's a protection from others. And of course, don't compete. Uh, it's easier said than done, but really I want to stress it. If your competitor slide looks like, oh, I'm better than this, 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 and this, because you know I'm a little bit cheaper, I'm a little bit better, honestly, maybe give up or really rethink your strategy. Deep tech companies normally have a, like three, two, one, zero competitors. Uh, you might have some references, but if your tech and business strategy doesn't substantially change the industry in a way that you're leapfrogging everyone else, it's going to be really, really tough for you to make your case with corporates and governments, etc. And so as a recap, it's about the customer. Uh, that might sound like what every sort of talk on go-to-market says, but in difficult industries, it really means find unfair ways to get that feedback. Again, New Quantum, they literally help organize the UK Quantum Trade Association that then got them that feedback. I mean, this is the sort of level of thinking differently that I'm saying. Rapid adaptation, again, green jets, they figure out ways in which they can prototype very rapidly, and they, that got them into defense contracts. Uh, they are now unlocking bigger contracts. So again, they don't necessarily want to be a defense company full stop. They want to actually serve the purpose of decarbonizing aviation, which we all need for the future of our climate. But they figured out that they need to get revenue to get there. Again, think about how you can use that rapid prototyping and adaptation to your advantage. Leverage partnerships, again, figure out ways, again, NATO, Diana, gover UK government, they've got a bunch of programs out there where you can get easily into talking to people that then can connect you higher up in the food chain. And then cash is king. Again, unless you're one of those lucky companies that can raise hundreds of millions when you're still no revenue, no product, then it is not impossible to make some revenue just as a proof point to then unlock further funding. Uh, and so that's something you can, you know, focus and stress you. So that's me, managed to get it all through. I hope I have some time for questions because really it's all about you. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much for listening. These are my contacts, Francesco from Silico Roundabout Ventures. Thank you. Thank you. Question, the one question. What's your one killer question for Francesco? Is it, is it Use it wisely. What's your one killer question? <laughs> I, there you go. Just give a shout out. Um, I'll, I'll shout out. Love your point on regulation as moats. As an investor, is someone with a legal regulatory background as a founder something that would put you off? Or is it something that would 
interest you? I mean, I'm not sure I fully understand in the sense that per se is not necessarily a bad thing or a good thing. Um, irrespective of whether it's legal or any other background, my, my, my answer would apply, which is how can you build a story, a credible story, and not just for investors, but also for customers, whereby your unique insights that you got, maybe because of your background or what happened, or your founder's backgrounds combined, give you an unfair advantage over everyone else. Now, if you can point that out quite clearly, then that could be very interesting. You know, if your background gives you an insight that even big corporates are kind of missing out on, uh, then that could be useful. Thank you. That's right. We, we, uh, I want to thank Francesco again, because I think that's this whole thing, when you're working with startup, when you're applying yourself, the whole product market fit, how you prove it, having the resilience, taking the knocks, but the key thing I think that Francesco said that really resonated with me, and I'll leave you as a challenge to reflect on is how are you building and nurturing trust with the important people in your ecosystem? Not least your customers, but your partners and so on. That's a very human thing that can be aided by AI, but how are you building and nurturing trust? Because as I was going to invest in you, I'd want to under understand how you're doing that. And with that challenge, I'm also going to ask you a challenge. Could we get a clear out now? We've got a five minute networking break before uh, our next presentation, where we've got some colleagues from Google and others to, 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 to give us some, some insights. So, uh, one final uh, round of applause for that great presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.